Hello, everyone. Allow me to welcome you to this virtual Food Bank Leadership Institute session on starting a food bank, moving from concept to impact. My name is Chris Rebstock. I'm one of GFN's field services directors. We appreciate so many people from time zones all over the world taking time to participate today. Before we get started, I'd like to address a few housekeeping items. All presentations will be in English, but we will have simultaneous interpretation in Spanish and French. Please click on the interpretation button at the bottom of your screen to select your preferred language. The session is being recorded and you will be sent the link to access the recording after the session is completed. Finally, there will be a question and answer session after the presentations. If you have a question or comment you would like us to address, please type it in the question and answer box at the bottom of your screen and we will address it at that time. To begin, I'd like to provide some context for GFN's work in helping establish food banks. When GFN was started in 2006, it was with the dual mission of supporting food banks where they exist and helping start food banks where they are needed. Please go to the next slide. To date, we have assisted the development of food banking in nearly 20 countries. And one more slide. In a moment, you will hear from our president and CEO a review of how we support food banks and how we approach strengthening their effectiveness to enhance their reach and their impact. You will then hear from several team members about how we approach the process of assisting local leaders who undertake to establish food banking for the first time in their communities. And finally, you will hear from one recently developed food bank regarding how engagement with GFN accelerated her food bank's development. Then we will take time to address your questions and comments. So first, allow me to introduce Lisa Moon, GFN's president and CEO since 2015. Thanks, Chris, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being with us today. Um, it's truly our pleasure to be able to get to know you a little better um, and learn about what you are hoping to do in your communities. Um, as Chris mentioned, uh, the Global Food Banking Network, or GFN for short, uh, celebrates its 15th anniversary this year. And we were created, as Chris mentioned, with the express mission of supporting um, new and existing food banks, um, individuals like yourselves who have um, a commitment and a vision to address both hunger and food loss and waste in your communities. Um, we were actually formed um, as a result of uh, four food banking networks, um, the national networks in the United States and Canada in Argentina and in Mexico had begun to receive inquiries from people all over the world that wanted to start food banks in their communities. And they really had a remit to focus on, on their communities. And so they thought there would be use to have um, an organization expressly focused on, on supporting new food banks. And so that was the really the um, the creation of GFN. Uh, Chris Rebstock uh, joined the organization very early on as a founder and has been with, um, with us for the past 15 years, uh, working with colleagues like yourself um, to, to, support, to support them in changing their communities. So what I want to do is talk a little bit about where we are today, and, um, and then we'll hand it back over to Chris uh, to talk more about how we work specifically with startups. Um, so our organization vision is a world free of hunger uh, with a mission to help nourish the world's hungry through uniting and advancing food banks. Um, and we really seek, we're a support organization. Um, we really exist to come alongside leaders um, and provide technical support, uh, catalytic financing in some cases, um, and partnerships that help uh, community-based organizations address hunger longer term. Uh, we work with a, a, a significant range of organizations. So um, if David, you wanna to go to the next slide, that'd be great. Uh, currently we support food banks in 44 countries and it's a real 
Uh, it's a real range of organizations. Some food banks that we work with have been established for decades, um, but many of them uh, have been established in the last five years. So really depending on the types of organizations um, and where they are in their cycle of development, that really affects the types of services that we're able to provide. Um, but one of the benefits though of working with GFN um, is not only do you have access to um, our team of experts who have uh, interacted with food banks in so many different cultural and economic and contexts who have decades of experience with this model, um, but you also have access to this entire network of, of leaders um, like yourselves who uh, are doing very innovative and creative things to carry out um, hunger relief and food loss and waste work in their communities. So um, we support food banks in 44 countries. In 2019, that numbered about 900 locations um, across the world. Uh, in 2019, and I'll talk about 2020 here in a moment, but in 2019, that community of food banks uh, served about 16.9 million people facing hunger. Uh, as we'll talk about in a minute, the food banking model is unique in the sense that it actually works in many cases with uh, partner charities. So looking at how do you support school feeding programs, orphanages, livelihood development projects, all sorts of other social services that exist in a community that need food as a way to to engage clients and, and meet those needs. Um, and so the network of social service agencies that food banks associated with GFN are serving are significant. It's 56,000 social service organizations in 2019. And so this all comes together to have an incredible global impact. Um, obviously, this past year has been incredibly difficult, I'm sure, for all of you and obviously um, for, for um, all of the communities that, that we're working with. And food banks, in many cases, rose to the, to the challenge. Um, so last year in the GFN network, uh, between March and November 2020, food banks uh, served about 27.6 million people facing hunger. So. Um, these community-based organizations, uh, when rolled up, have an incredible global impact. And we believe and see that food banking as a model has an incredible opportunity to address the sustainable development goals, especially the ones focused on zero hunger and zeroing out food loss and waste. David, if you could go to the next slide. Uh, Chris and the others today will talk more about our model, but um, just wanted to reinforce that really we're focused on how do we support community-based initiatives um, and community leaders. And, um, and our expertise, we've got a range of it on staff, really focuses on the model itself, operationally, how do you, how do you build a food bank? What type of capitalization planning do you need? Um, how do you make sure that uh, the logistics are, are exactly as efficient as they need to be? Um, and we have obviously special expertise in food sourcing, um, thinking about how do you procure product in a way that's nutritious and economically sustainable for organizations. And also thinking about how you work with agencies and how do you make sure that you're targeting the types of vulnerable groups and communities effectively. Next slide, please. And we'll go ahead and jump to the next one, David, thank you. So this is just like I said, a snapshot of our work um, in 2019 again, but what I really wanted to emphasize here is that GFN, you know, for the first about 10 years, we really focused on kind of the food banking organizations that were predominantly in Central and South America, and then more in East Asia, but we have made a commitment as an organization for the next several years to be focusing on supporting food banks expansion, um, especially in very high need places. This includes uh, Southeast and South Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, and then there's a few places in South America that do not yet have food banks or we're not working with um, a strong partner there. And so this has become a very significant part of our work. Um, and we've developed a number of programs to support organizations that are either at the startup stage or um, at the kind of the new stage and we're really excited uh, to, to be bringing new partners into the fold on this. So with that, I'll actually turn it back to Chris to talk more uh, specifically about the foundation services we provide for new food banks. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, Lisa. So again, to set context, let me discuss how GFN defines what a food bank is. A food bank is an entity that distributes food and grocery products to the hungry at scale. 
Its goal is to achieve large scale, broad, community wide distribution. So we're not talking about a small food pantry operating in a local community center or a church or mosque. A food bank operates without discrimination. Its services and products are made available to the community as a whole. A substantial proportion of the products it distributes are donated by commercial food establishments and or government. So it is not simply a nonprofit buyer of food that it then redistributes. Many food banks do buy products in order to complement their inventories because not all staple items that are necessary for local dietary needs or local nutritional needs uh, are, are available by donation on a regular basis. So some food banks do uh, buy products to complement their inventories, but those purchases are not the primary source of their products. A food bank depends upon successfully established and maintained alliances with a broad base of stakeholders throughout all sectors of society, the public sector, the private sector, and all segments of civil society. These alliances provide the lifeblood of the food bank and make it an integral part of that community that it, that it resides in. So for this reason, among others, a food bank is typically and ideally an NGO. While governments may be, and in the past have been, involved in starting food banks as community service programs of their own, they typically spin the food bank off as an NGO and that makes it uh, much more uh, sustainable for a number of reasons that we'll go into uh, in a little more depth later. Next slide, please. So how does, food, how does a food bank work? Um, as you see in the, in the slide here on the left, uh, food and grocery products are donated from throughout the entire um, breadth of the supply chain, from farms and fisheries, um, through manufacturers and processors, uh, down through the distribution channels and to the retail channels, um, grocery stores and even restaurants uh, where uh, product is surplus. It's uh, fit for consumption, but for any number of reasons um, has lost commercial value and is, uh, and is no longer um, saleable. And sometimes governments uh, provide product and, and the product that comes from governments typically comes as a result of the government having price support programs um, in place that uh, whereby they acquire commodities or, or, um, or, or different um, food uh, items in their country to support the farmers, to support prices. Um, and they'll use a portion of those foods uh, to take care of food insecure uh, citizens through charitable infrastructure. And the food bank represents the, the most effective infrastructure in being able to get those commodities into the hands of people that need them. So food is channeled from all these different resources into the community food bank, which um, is a, a nonprofit uh, organization operating a warehouse. Uh, functionally, it's very much like a commercial food distributor um, except that it's operating at, uh, at no profit. Um, it's gathering all this food into its warehouse. In some cases, it has to manipulate the food. Um, say, for example, a donor of rice provides a um, bulk uh, container, pallet-sized container of rice. Um, that, that product needs to be broken down into consumer-sized packaging so that it can be distributed to families and individuals. So there may be need for some manipulation or handling of the product in the, in the food bank uh, in order to get it ready to go out to the community organizations that Lisa referred to um, before. And those community organizations are a broad um, uh, spectrum of organizations. Some, some of them exist solely for the purpose of feeding people uh, a soup kitchen or a food pantry. Um, and some of them are, uh, are broader organizations delivering other services uh, to people who have various needs. Um, but because of the nature of their programming, perhaps their residential organization, like a, an orphanage or a senior folks uh, home or a drug and alcohol rehabilitation center or a homeless shelter or a domestic abuse shelter, 
Um, so they, they're a residential organization. They need to be able to feed their residents um, uh, while they are delivering the other um, charitable uh, services that they uh, are primarily in existence to, to deliver. So that's that's the um, the overall picture. Um, to the next slide, David. Thank you. There are a number of different models of food banks, um, especially as we've seen them replicate uh, across many different uh, societies and many different cultures. But at the core, uh, they're all the same. The core is that warehouse-based uh, operation. Uh, where food is being gathered from throughout the supply chain, distributed uh, to the um, community-based organizations and NGOs um, that uh, depend upon the food bank. Um, and that's, that's the basic model. There are a number of, of additional add-ons that, um, that many food banks adopt. A couple examples are provided here on the slide. The first is prepared food. Um, in, uh, in a prepared food model, uh, the food bank is collecting um, prepared food left over from uh, catering venues, um, independent caterers and hotel uh, catering operations, conventions and, and weddings and, and those kinds of events, um, as well as from individual restaurants. Um, and they're taking that product directly from the donor, typically, uh, to the community organizations that are going to use it immediately uh, in their feeding programs. Handling prepared foods, as you would imagine, has heightened food safety uh, implications and the logistics are more difficult um, and in, in many ways more costly. Um, and so it's not typical that that food is brought back into a warehouse and then redistributed um, at some point in the future. It needs to be handled much more quickly. And so it's typically rapid distribution from the donor uh, to the uh, consuming organization. Another common model uh, that is added is what we refer to as virtual food banking. Um, some, some organizations, especially uh, individual grocery stores or cafes um, uh, may have product that uh, they want to make available uh, to the food banks, but the, the, the each individual donation may be much smaller in scale um, than it uh, is cost effective for the food bank to be able to get. Think about a chain of grocery stores for a minute. Um, so a community may have 50 different uh, grocery stores in a particular um, grocery chain. Um, and each may have um, 50 or 100 or even 200 um, kilos of product every day that it, that it wants to donate. Um, but think about the logistics of the food bank having vehicles to run routes and uh, collect all of that product on a regular basis. Um, it would be very, very difficult. So this virtual food banking model uh, has evolved wherein the food bank manages um, introductions and maintaining relationships between individual beneficiary organizations and the donors of those small size donations. The food bank never actually handles those products, those donations, the, by making the connection um, on, on an agreed upon regular schedule, the, eight, the beneficiary organization goes and picks up the smaller donations directly from the donor uh, for their own use. They're not redistributed. Um, they're, and, and all of the information related to that donation, the data about what, what the products are, the volume of the products, uh, the information that's necessary to provide the the uh, proper kind of receiving to the donor uh, for the donation. All of that is centralized at the food bank um, and typically through a technology uh, based, a, a, a smartphone based uh, application where the agency um, picks up the donation, enters the data that's, that's necessary that gets transmitted to the food bank. The food bank can centralize all that data and communicate with the donor on a regular basis about uh, the volume of activity. 
So a, a very valuable way to get a quite large um, uh, volume of product um, donated, uh, even though the individual donations are relatively small in scale. Next slide, please. So all of this raises question about what kind of infrastructure does a developing food bank need to have? And obviously um, the answer to that question depends on what kind of model uh, the, the planners of the food bank um, are anticipating putting in place. Consideration needs to be given to the type of foods that's gonna be handled, the method of collection and distribution, and what kind of storage requirements um, there will be. Of course, the underlying and most important factor in all of this has to do with maintaining food safety. Um, the food bank, it, it's absolutely critical that the food bank take all the appropriate steps in every part of program design to ensure that the food that's donated to them and trusted to them by their donors um, is in fact going to be uh, healthy and nutrition and um, and fit for consumption when it is passed on to the beneficiaries. So that that means that as the as the planners are thinking about the the facility itself and the vehicles that they will need and the equipment that they they will need, they have to think that through um, very specifically based on the types of product they anticipate receiving. Um, and, and whether that product is going to be ambient temperature, uh, require refrigeration, as in some fr fresh fruits and vegetables, uh, dairy product, um, um, and, and such, and, and even uh, whether they need uh, commercial freezing cap capability in order to handle um, products that are coming to them in a frozen uh, condition. They will also need to uh, focus as well on uh, technology and ultimately um, the distribution network. And that distribution network is made up of those community-based organizations and NGOs uh, that we've talked about previously. Next slide, please. Ultimately, a food bank is a community asset. Um, Food banks bridge the gap between surplus and need specifically by building and managing a community infrastructure. This infrastructure represents, rep, um, it includes representatives from throughout the public and private sectors and civil society. As such, it allows the food bank to engage those representatives in consideration of longer term solutions to food insecurity and food loss and waste. You'll hear more about that uh, soon. So in that capacity, the food bank is truly a community asset. The best description of that fact that I ever heard was by the chair of the city council from a major Texas city at a training session we conducted some years ago in his city. Speaking to our uh, attendees at that training session, he made the following comment. The city council and the mayor think about our food bank the same way we think about the police and fire departments and the education and healthcare systems in our city. The food bank is essential to our ability to sustain a healthy city. That's a great comment. Um, and it's great recognition of the outcomes of food banking. And actually on that topic of food bank outcomes, please allow me to introduce um, GFN's vice president of programming Doug O'Brien, who's going to go a little deeper uh, into those outcomes. Doug. Thank you, Chris. <clears throat> as Chris shared, food banks, when scaled, are just as essential to resilient communities as hospitals, schools, and emergency services. I'll address what that means in terms of outcomes for the work of food banks. At their core, food banks exist to address the problem of hunger and food insecurity. And as this past year of pandemic has shown, the role of food banks to meet local emergency food security needs has been absolutely vital. 
Let's first establish that the challenge of hunger and food insecurity the world faces today is not due to a lack of food produced around the world. Global food production exceeds what is necessary to feed every person on the planet every day and with surplus. And this has been true for many decades. The problem of hunger and food insecurity arises from a lack of access to food. And the most frequent reason for lack of access is poverty or economic disadvantage, temporary or long-term. The lack of economic means to buy food can create a cycle of poverty that then leads to hunger. And that leads then in turn to more poverty. And this cycle can repeat itself in families and communities for generations. As the World Bank Group noted, food security is pivotal to any effective response to poverty. So how great is the problem of hunger and food insecurity or this problem of food access? More than 813 million people overall are estimated to be chronically hungry. And COVID has added another 296 million severely food insecure people, according to the most recent data. It's another way to describe growing hunger. This has led to an estimated 2 billion people who are food insecure today. That is those persons who rarely lack access to food and 3 billion who suffer nutrition deficiencies, unable to afford healthy diets. I know these numbers can seem overwhelming, too large to take on. It may seem insurmountable to reach the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal of zero hunger. But right now, the issue is not a lack of food, it's a lack of access. And this is where the food bank model is one tool that's possible today and right now in our own hands help address hunger where it is experienced and closest to where the need is. And addressing hunger community by community can add up to significant and meaningful impact across the globe, beginning in, in your own community and then spreading out when aggregated. Food banks provide pathways to food security supplying more nutritious food that may be affordable to many families and filling in gaps where social protection is insufficient or non-existence and therefore help break the cycle of poverty and improve the lives of millions. Next slide, please. As Chris mentioned, it's the very model by which food banks provide hunger relief that distinguish this work. Food banks operate the nexus of two great global objectives. SDG 2, which is zero hunger, and SDG 12, which is responsible consumption and having food waste. Significant amounts of food, an estimated one third of all food produced is wasted or lost. This creates enormous societal and environmental harm to both people and the planet. The food bank model is developed to secure this surplus and redirect it. The action of food recovery and redistribution occurs across the globe in thousands of communities, in towns, villages, and cities. The cumulative outcome and impact of these community-based activities in 2019 was to redirect 3.7 million metric tons of surplus food from landfills and thereby preventing more than 12.39 billion kilograms of greenhouse gas emissions. And in turn, this activity help feed more than 66 million food insecure people worldwide. That work was accomplished again, community by community in more than 70 countries. And in roughly half of those countries, the food banks have been in existence for less than two decades. When considered this way, adding to the broader global movement, the addition of community by community approach to address hunger and food loss and waste, each community's unique food security challenges can be addressed in their context and, and in methods that most meet their needs and help us get closer to the challenge of addressing zero hunger. Next slide, please. As Chris mentioned, to be most effective or to be the community asset that he referenced, food banks need to engage and serve as a convener of the various community stakeholders. These stakeholders can come from the public sector the private sector and all segments of civil society. The food bank is an, is an organizer of committed people, of leaders and officials and institutions to address the problem of hunger that exists right in front of them, where they're closest to the problem and therefore more likely to offer specific and effective solutions. 
So the influence of food bank is now broadened from the provision of a meal or a food box to even more effective solutions, engaging a wide stakeholder base and the resources of business and government and other actors seeking long-term solutions. Food banks can serve a crucial role and offer a meaningful voice in long-term policy and policies and programs that help build community and family resilience and economic mobility. Some of these areas of, of impact um, that we've seen around the world include um, building out social protection expansions, you know, the safety net for economically disadvantaged people in low-income households building greater gender equity through support of school meals and child maternal food assistance, protections for informal workers and support for the unemployed, early child and school age feeding programs, programs for the homeless, for migrants and for displaced persons. And in the environmental space, specific policies related to reducing food loss and waste, strengthening agriculture and overall building larger food system resilience. Food banks also engage very directly in food donation policies, helping to create tax incentives to give good food rather than throw it away, liability and volunteer protections, and food labeling policies, all which combine to help create a stronger community. The food bank's nearly unique role as convener of community stakeholders, focused on a common mission to reduce hunger and food insecurity, can help directly address why are there hungry in our midst, and what can we do together to address it? The food bank's core mission of feeding the hungry helps also advance the global cause of zero hunger, starting in our own communities by providing the critical benefit of food access. It reduces food loss and waste, and thereby strengthens food systems, both locally and globally, and helps protect the environment. As a convener of community stakeholders, the food banks help identify and advocate for broader support for disadvantaged people, both in the immediate and long term through these public policies and programs. This localized community approach to the food bank model is a tool that is in our hands now. We don't have to invent it. And it has great potential to transform lives like few other institutions can. And the outcome of this work in our communities when scaled has significant global impact. So now let me turn this presentation over to my colleague, Anthony Kitchen, who will discuss the assessment process for helping you determine um, whether or not establishing a food bank in your community is uh, right now. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Doug. So as Doug mentioned, I'm Anthony Kitchen. I'm the Director of Programs at GFN. And I'd like to start by extending my welcome to all of you for, join, for joining us today from wherever you are in the world. And we're particularly excited that you've joined us today for this particular webinar, because the very, the very fact that you're here today means that the least you have expressed an interest in starting a food bank. And I believe some of you are actually a lot further down the path of, of making that a reality. And I'm sure that what you've already heard from my colleagues today has reinforced that, that interest and that desire to start a food bank. You've heard what a, great, what a great model the food banking model is. It really is one of those rare win-win situations. You can support vulnerable and hungry people in your country, in your community, while simultaneously reducing food loss and waste and helping the environment. So of course, that's something you, you would want to do. But in many ways, the hard work starts now. And that's what the next sections of this, of this presentation are gonna be about. You heard Chris earlier on talk about how a food bank is a community asset. And that when you commit to creating a food bank, you are making a commitment to your community. Therefore, it's very important that that food bank is sustainable and long lasting. I completely understand the, the temptation just to dive in, get going right away, get that, get the fulfillment of making an impact in your community. But we would really urge you, conducting a thorough and rigorous planning process will give you a far better chance of creating a long-lasting community asset through your food bank. 
So for the next few minutes, I'm going to talk about the feasibility assessment, which is really looking at how do you determine if the food banking model is going to work and how it could work in your environment, in your country or community. And then after that, I'll hand back to Chris, who will talk you through the detailed planning process. So with that, let's dive right into it. So on to the first slide, please, David. So the feasibility assessment is a very thorough information gathering phase. And the output of this phase is effectively a document. And that document should include at least four chapters. Now, of course, you can add more sections and more information if you want to, but these four are the chapters that you must have or sections that you must cover. And so we'll go into each of those in turn now. So on the next slide, we'll talk about understanding the need. And this is really who are you trying to help? Understanding the hunger situation in your country. If you are a startup business, you would be spending a lot of time thinking about your potential customer base and analyzing that. So if you flip that, it's very similar in the nonprofit world. Who are your clients? Who are your potential clients and understanding more about them? Um, to do this, you're going to want to collect demographic as well as geographic data. Who are the people that are hungry? Why are they hungry? What type of people are they? Um, who, are the, who are the most vulnerable? How many are women, children, or seniors, or indigenous populations? Who are the most vulnerable, again, and why? Then where are they? Again, yeah, you'll have a good idea of this in your, home, in your hometown or city through driving around, but are you looking at one city or town? Are you looking at multiple cities? You also wanna think about the split between urban and rural. In a lot of areas, rural, rural areas have very high uh, poverty and hunger as well. So think about those. The rural areas can be more, more difficult to get to. How far away from you are those areas? How far away from sources of food are those areas? What are the roads like in getting to those places? How long would it take to get there? All things that you need to think about. As you're going through this process, we urge you to look for data. Even if the data is not perfect, there should be something out there. Go to your government at the national government level, the local or municipal government level. Uh, other aid agencies may have some data available. Please look around. The best decision making is likely to be based on data. So do try and make your decision making data driven as much as you can. Not only that will that give you a more robust plan, but later on in the process, when it comes to writing proposals for grants and funding, donors will want to see some actual hard data that those proposals are based on as well. Also, you need to really think about cultural, religious, and ethnic requirements as well. This may affect both the type of food and products that you're looking to get, but it may also impact the type of service uh, that, that you wish to provide as well. And Chris hinted at this earlier, but in order to be a certified member of GFM, it will come further down in your process, um, we do insist that you have a non-discriminatory policy that is publicly available. So something else to keep in mind. So if you move on to the next chapter, on the next slide. And <clears throat> so now you've understood what the need is, in, the, in your environment, you want to understand who else is trying to address that need and how. You want to really think about who's doing what so you can understand and position yourselves and where you are going to fit into this landscape. So starting with the who, who is working in this area? It could be government programs. It could be international NGOs. It could be small, local, sort of grassroots charities or organizations helping. In likelihood, it's probably a combination of all of the above, but you just need to get a feel for the landscape that you are going to be going into. It's not just who, it's how are those organizations delivering their services. Is it through feeding centers? Is it school feeding programs, after school programs? 
Are they delivering food and product directly to people's homes? How often are they delivering those services? If it's only infrequently, how are those beneficiaries getting food the rest of the time? And again, really think about how are you going to fit into this landscape? Can you partner with existing organizations? Maybe an agency charity that's doing something now. Maybe you can work so you provide them with food and they concentrate on the service that they're providing. You concentrate on the food, they concentrate on the education or the healthcare or the service that they're providing and you both spit, stick to your respective areas of expertise. Remember the goal for everybody here is to help as many people in the community as thoroughly as you can. And very often collaborating with others and forming partnerships is going to be the best way to do that. Um, and as you go through this, think about collaboration, but also think when you're positioning yourselves, if you are positioning yourselves in direct competition with somebody else, that is probably not going to be the best thing for, for your community. So please think about that. Okay, as we move on to the next slide. We're, so, so far we've really looked at the service side of things, the service that you would be providing when you're operational. So now let's look at the other side and think about the inputs that you will need to, to build and run a successful food bank. And often here we talk about three Fs, which works well in English. Uh, and that is funds, food, and friends. So let's start with the most important of those, which is funds, money. Now, no organization, whether for-profit or not-for-profit, is going to last if there's not money coming in. Obviously, that is absolutely vital. So you need to think about where are you going to get that money from, both seed capital to start up, both seed capital to start up, and then ongoing capital expenses, capex, and operating expenses, your opex. You will need capital expenditure to acquire infrastructure, warehouse or storage space. Regardless of whether you're leasing or buying, you will need money to get that storage space. You'll need to get vehicles, most likely. You may need to get some cold chain, as in cold rooms and vehicles that have got temperature control on them. Uh, as you grow and want to introduce new programs to expand your impact, you will need money to launch those programs. Operating expenses, you will need to pay staff. Uh, you'll need to pay utility bills. You'll need to pay fuel and maintenance on your vehicles and so on. So where is that money going to come from? Um, what is the culture of giving and philanthropy in your country? Um, are there pockets of rich people that are known to be philanthropic? What about corporate social responsibility or CSR or CSI? in some countries. To what extent is that well established and are companies, particularly larger companies and multinationals, known to give money? What type of programs do they give to and how are those programs structured? What do you need to do to apply to those? International sources. Are there, are there aid agencies based overseas, big international ones that, that might give money in your country? Another question, which is a much bigger question, is will you charge your agencies that receive the food, not the individuals that ultimately consume the food, but a, the larger agencies that you give, that you're providing food to? Uh, and that's something we've got plenty more information we can give you in resources. Okay, so next up, if we move to the next slide, and we'll talk about food. Now, obviously, the clue is in the title of a food bank. Without food coming in, you're not going to be feeding anybody and you're not going to be having any impact. So how are you going to get that food? Again, early on, Chris mentioned in the definition of a food bank that the majority of food that comes in is donated. It's food that, for a wide variety of reasons, has become unsaleable and is, and is surplus. Um, so you need to, in this phase, you need to be thinking about and getting a deep understanding of the food supply chain in your country, starting with the agricultural sector, uh, large commercial farms, smallholder farmers, everything in between. 
uh, through to processes and manufacturers, through to distributors and retailers and markets, the food service sector, which is hotels, restaurants, cafes, canteens, etc. So really thinking of the whole farm to fork supply chain. So think about uh, importers and exporters. Is your country a net importer or net exporter of food? Because on both sides, there could be opportunities to rescue surplus there. So how does food move around within your country? What's the logistics and supply chain mechanisms there? Who are the big logistics companies, both hauliers and warehouse operators? Often it's, it's the same companies. That can be a big opportunity. You also need to under, get an understanding of the secondary market. What happens to surplus food if you are not there to collect it? Is it getting dumped in landfill or anywhere else? If so, a company's charged to dump their food. Um, is it going to, to farmers for animal feed? Is it going to alternative energy sources such as anaerobic digestion? If so, are people getting paid to get that food? You need to understand when you go to talk to companies what their options are and how you fit in with those options and can make a compelling case. Again, at GFN, we have a lot of resources on product sourcing that we can, we can help provide you with. The last of the three Fs was friends. And really what we mean by that is volunteers. Now, you will need a core of paid salaried staff. But beyond that, volunteers make a huge difference. And indeed, volunteers are really the lifeblood of, of most food banks in the world. So again, think about this. What is the culture of volunteering in your country? Is there even that culture? What volunteer programs have you seen work well and why do they work well? Why do people want to go and volunteer for that organization or that organization? How do you keep them coming back? Also think about skills-based volunteering. What are the professional services that you're gonna need help on? And can you get that for pro bono or free, which is volunteering? Um, legal services, accounting, IT, supply chain help, all sorts of things that you may be able to get with skills-based volunteering. And on the next slide, we'll talk through the, the last of the sort of compulsory chapters. So if we move on to the next slide, um, is the legal and regulatory issues. And of course, this can be quite complex. Of course, you need to be on the right side of the law and the regulations, but to do that, you need to know what they are. Um, so firstly, how and where do you register as a nonprofit or charitable organization? What does that application process look like? What do you need to provide? How long does that process take? In a lot of countries, that application process can take a very long time. You wanna factor that into your planning. Um, it's very unlikely anybody's gonna donate anything until you are registered as a nonprofit in an official organization. To maintain that status, what, what do you need to provide uh, year in, year out, audited financial accounts, tax statements, et cetera? Um, so also, you are going to be handling, transporting, and distributing food. What special permits or licenses do you need to be able to do that? Um, where do you get those from? Who are the regulatory bodies and standards bodies that provide food hygiene and food safety certification in your country? Even if you don't need that certification by law, we would highly recommend you get it and you get regularly audited by a recognized food safety authority it will really help your conversations with, with food companies later on. Um, other things, can you receive money from overseas? If you identified that a lot of your funding was gonna come from overseas, can you actually get money into the country? You may need to fill in extra paperwork and it can be quite a cumbersome process. Um, and Chris mentioned earlier the role of government as well, uh, which of course is something you need to consider. Okay, so just finally to wrap up on the last slide here, is this document really, and all the information that goes into it will get you to a point where you can make a go or no-go decision, where you decide, yes, we think we can do this, the environment is right for building a food bank, or you may actually think, 
this isn't going to work here. Let's think of think of a, a plan B. But the information that you've gathered in this assessment phase will be extremely valuable in the next phase, which is the detailed planning that you're going to conduct. And all that information will really help to shape and influence that planning. And on that note, I'm going to hand it back over to, over to Chris to go through that section. Thank you, Tony. So assuming that you've completed your feasibility assessment and the findings do indicate that the conditions would support a food bank in your community, how do you approach designing what that food bank should look like and what will be needed in order to launch its operations? We're going to uh, take a few minutes now um, walking through uh, the answers to that question. So next slide. This, uh, for the, the next um, uh, few slides, we're going to walk through the design of a planning process, as well as the, um, the components that go into that planning process and the outputs that it generates and, and how those are used uh, to reach the point of implementation. So we're gonna talk about the planning infrastructure. Um, who to involve, how to structure that planning, um, how to engage uh, the, the people who are involved in meaningful ways uh, to build the business plan, the capitalization plan. We're gonna talk about uh, planning timeline, um, uh, the financial plan that must be uh, part of uh, the business plan. Um, and then, uh, as I indicated, the capitalization plan to make it all happen. Uh, next slide. So who should sit at the table? Because the food bank is being designed to become a community asset, and because the successful, uh, uh, the successful execution of a food bank's work is dependent on engagement from stakeholders throughout um, the breadth of uh, society, it's important that the planning process be as inclusive as possible. To get to the point of trying to identify who are the people uh, from throughout the, the segments of society um, that should be uh, sitting at the table, you need to think about what it is that you're actually trying to put together. Um, you, you know what the concept of the food bank is. Um, you need to ask yourself a few questions around the design and the execution of that concept. Who owns the food bank? Of course, as a nonprofit organization, it doesn't really have owners as such. Um, uh, but ultimately, who, who are you making the services that you're going to deliver? Who, who are you accountable to in the delivery of those services? Of course, um, on a day-to-day -day basis, the staff and the volunteers are accountable to the management and the management is accountable to the board of directors. To whom are the board of directors accountable? It's the society, right? It's the, it's the, it's the community that in which the food bank is operating. As, as Tony mentioned uh, earlier on in his presentation, um, establishing the food bank is making a commitment to your community and you kind of have a moral obligation to stand behind that commitment. Um, and so you need to think of the establishment of the food bank in the breadth of um, ownership that the community has on that nonprofit organization. Um, and that includes, of course, who it, who it serves. Um, as you think through the various components of the assessment that Tony just walked through, you can you can begin to see the framing of who the broad the broad base of stakeholders are going to be uh, that are are going to facilitate your ability to put the food bank in place um, and define its programming. And and the last question is, what will that programming be um, in order to achieve the goals? That you're setting based on whatever model of food banking that you intend to, to develop, um, what are the scale and scope of the services that are going to be necessary uh, in order to put that all in place. 
So ultimately it's about collaboration and it's about leveraging the partnerships and the alliances that you create um, during the planning process and after uh, the execution of the plan. Next slide. So this uh, chart is intended to identify some of the, the um, obvious stakeholders that you should try and include um, in building the business plan. Recognize that because these everybody that's listed here um, in the public sector and in the private sector um, and throughout civil society, um, because these folks are all going to be folks that you're going to, or institutions that you're going to need to engage with um, as the food bank is, is working to fulfill its mission, it's important to try and in, involve them, engage them right from the very beginning in the planning process so that they have voice into how their particular um, discipline or their particular area of, of uh, expertise can be reflected in the programming and administration of the organization. Next slide. We recommend that you um, pull together a, a small uh, leadership team, a core team as, as we refer to it, um, that uh, will function as the uh, managers of the process. Um, you have to recognize that the development of the business plan is not a, a fast process. Um, you will have spent um, a number of months, maybe as many as six or eight months, um, going through the feasibility analysis um, process that uh, Tony just walked you through. Um, and, and coming out of that process and using the information you gathered there um, and information that you're going to uh, continue to gather through the, the, the rest of the business plan development process, um, again, you're not looking at a, a few weeks of, of work. You're, you're looking at months of work um, that will focus on a, a, a broad number of uh, disciplines. And so you need a leadership team that kind of uh, keeps it all going and shepherds the, the, the stakeholders who are involved in the planning, um, shepherds them through the process to make sure that you're hitting all of the, um, all of the key issues um, and, and meeting the appropriate um, uh, timelines uh, for the, the planning. So that core team should be three, five, um, maybe a couple more, depending on local circumstances. Uh, people who uh, are come from your, your anticipated stakeholder base um, who will set the tone, they'll set the vision and the mission and the values of the organization and the timeline for the planning process. Um, they will, of course, always try to drive toward consensus um, as uh, various aspects of administration or operation or program design are, are being considered and, and sometimes debated. Um, the, the leaders will want to always try and drive toward consensus, but when necessary, uh, they also have to be prepared to just make the decision um, and set the direction for whatever that particular topic it, uh, is, uh, where there's not consensus, not full agreement. They need to be able to manage the resources and ultimately uh, develop the partnerships for the, the, the team itself. Um, next slide, please. You should recognize that there will be some, uh, likely be some, um, expenses involved in planning. It won't be a huge number, um, but uh, recognize that as you build a planning forum, um, a, a planning team made up of stakeholders who are working with the core group, that just convening people for meetings uh, will likely uh, involve some costs. There might be some local travel um, expenses. You might need to uh, rent a meeting space um, if you're having a half a day uh, planning session, you might want to um, provide uh, the participants with lunch. Um, so th those are all small expenses, but they are expenses. Um, you may incur some expenses around research. Um, there will need to be continued uh, research beyond what was done in the feasibility assessment 
um, in order to uh, determine how to structure various uh, components of the food bank's administration and, um, and more importantly, of the food bank's programming base, uh, defining exactly what it is that you're going to do and how you're going to do it. Um, and ultimately, as, as Tony said with the feasibility assessment, uh, uh, ending up um, uh, in a published report, um, this planning process is going to end in a published business plan, right? And capitalization plan. And so you may incur some expense with uh, uh, somebody to take all of the pieces that are coming to them from the planning forum, uh, th which may have broken down into subcommittees to focus on different disciplines in the, in the plan. Um, you may need to engage someone to do some report writing and have related back office expenses to that. So again, not a large amount of money, um, but, but you don't want to get partway into the planning process and then realize that you do need some funding and you don't have any way to fill it. Um, so that should be part of the discussions of the core team right up front. Um, next slide, please. So what are the deliverables? Um, we've, we've already referred to each of these um, uh, at a couple of different points. There are three deliverables of the planning process. The business plan itself, which incorporates a financial plan and then the resource development or capitalization plan. Next slide. So what, what is the business plan? The business plan is um, where you're going to define all of these different aspects of uh, what the food bank is um, uh, and how it will function and what infrastructure it will need and what uh, human resources it will need and what programming it's going to deliver. Next slide. The financial plan, um, Tony referred to, uh, to some of this in, in uh, reviewing the um, feasibility assessment. The financial plan is going to define what all of those components in the business plan are going to cost which of them are just one-time startup costs, capitalization budget, um, and which of them are ongoing uh, annual operations uh, costs, your uh, operations budget. And we recommend building into the business plan, not just the first year operations budget, but actually um, doing a projected three-year uh, operations budget. And we recognize that that's difficult, um, especially in a startup, uh, uh, organization. It's hard to anticipate what you don't know is going to happen when you reach the implementation point. And so it's difficult to build from what you expect the first year operations to, to cost. Um, it's difficult to uh, project what the second year and what the third year will be. Um, but uh, again, to Tony's point, that is you try to make your case to potential supporters as much of this kind of information as you can reasonably put together um, will better your ability to make the case statement uh, and get it in front of um, the, uh, the folks who can bring resources uh, to you. Next slide. We do have uh, sample budget planning uh, materials, uh, forms of, available uh, to give you a, a sense of the kind of line items that you need to look at in terms of um, your human resources and your general operations. Um, and uh, we can make these available to you. Uh, actually, they're included in our uh, business plan development toolkit. Um, and uh, we'll talk about the toolkits in, in just a minute. Next slide. And then the third deliverable, the capitalization plan. So once you know what you're going to need in order to launch your operation, how do you intend to go about um, getting that, uh, those resources in, in house? Um, you're going to be both raising cash um, as well as in-kind uh, goods and services. Um, 
and uh, again, you want to try and project uh, over the first couple of years, not just the first year, uh, about how you're going to generate the resources. Obviously, you don't have to build a three-year um, base of support in and have it sitting in the bank before you open the doors of the food bank. Uh, you can open uh, launch operations much earlier than that. But you do want to be thinking and planning and and have a plan in place for how you're going to uh, continue to to raise the resources that you need um, as you as you open and stabilize operations and then begin to scale uh, operations in the second and third year. Next slide, please. And um, and so that's uh, th that's pretty much what we've already talked about. Um, so now that we've walked through the process of uh, assessing feasibility and building the business plan and capitalization plan, I know that one of your first questions at this point is probably, okay, how can GFN help me with all of that? Well, to, to answer that question, I'm going to bring back uh, Doug O'Brien. Um, and then after Doug talks about how GFN can be helpful, we will hear from Astrid Paramita, CEO and co-founder of Food Cycle in Indonesia. Astrid will talk about the establishment of Food Cycle and how GFN was helpful in accelerating the organization's development. So Doug, over to you. Thank you, Chris. Um, so now that we've shared the various planning and preparations you should consider, let me speak about, um, as Chris mentioned, how GFN can help you through this process. GFN offers a number of resources to assist in the establishment of a new food bank. It is our aim to help you succeed. These resources include toolkits across a wide spectrum of, of food bank activity, planning and preparation. It will help guide you through each part of the process. Technical assistance provided via email, phone, and Zoom. Primarily, and that means because of global travel restrictions, um, Introduction to GFN member food banks who can share their experiences, operations, and best practices, and potential introductions to global corporate partners similarly committed to hunger relief and preventing food loss and waste and strengthening the communities in which they operate. So to speak a little about how GFN works with new food banks, I'd like to introduce Astrid Paramita of Food Cycle Indonesia. As Chris mentioned, she is a co-founder of and CEO of Food Cycle. And the food bank is one of GFN's recent South Asia, South Asia project members. In a very short time, less than two years, Food Cycle has shown impressive growth and community impact. And we think her experience will be very useful. So Astrid, can you speak about the experience in developing a new food bank from your context? Yes, thank you, Doug, for the intro. Hi everyone, my name is Astrid from Food Cycle Indonesia. I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about our organizations, which many of you probably relate um, as we just, we are actually new. So we started in November, 2017, uh, doing food drive, picking up access food from wedding parties. And in the first year we saved about uh, three tons of wedding food. Um, we got quite good exposure from media and we started to pick up bread from bakeries and then we realized that there are actually so much more that we can do. Uh, so much food being wasted from many sources and yet at the same time uh, so many people don't have access to food. And to be able to achieve that, to do to scale, to expand like what Doug and uh, Chris has mentioned, we need resources, we need space, we need the people to do the work and etc. In 2019, we learned that such organization exists, which is Global Food Banking Network that specializes in nurturing food banks, and we approached them for support. One of the field director, Craig, came to Indonesia in uh, mid-2019 and spent 12 hours learning about our operations. We then got selected as one of the two organizations in Indonesia to be part of the GFN Asia Incubator Program. The biggest milestone for Food Cycle is when we got the seed funding from GFN 
and to, to start a food bank in Jakarta. And with that money uh, has enabled us to rent a warehouse and we're able to receive donations from food manufacturers, distributors and supermarkets. And not only money, but GFN also supports us with knowledge, advice, moral supports, and also the connections uh, with other food banks globally. And I think it's very invaluable. So long story short, last year, we distributed 206 tons of food to more than 27,000 uh, people through 50 plus agencies, or we call them frontline organizations. And all of these will not be possible without GFN support. Thank you, Astrid. We appreciate your uh, your um, comments. The um, at this point, we're going to take some time to address uh, questions and comments from the audience. Um, we noticed that a number of comments have been um, posted in the in the Q and A uh, um, window. Uh, at, you have a button for that at the bottom of your screen. Um, so if you have a question and you haven't posted it yet, uh, please do that. Um, and we'll, we'll get to as many of the questions as we're able to. Um, the first question that we have, uh, uh, is it possible for, ev any for everyone to join GFN and become a member? And do you have to pay to be a member of GFN? Could you share the terms and conditions, please? So um, becoming a member of uh, GFN uh, is a, uh, um, a process that will uh, take some time. Uh, Tony referred uh, earlier in his comments uh, to GFN certification, um, which, is, uh, which is the step that you take to become a full member of the, the GFN network. In order to uh, be certified by GFN, your administration and your operations need to comply with a set of uh, global food banking standards. Um, and and the, the first, uh, the, the, the toolkits that Doug referred to, uh, we have a, a series of toolkits called Starting a Food Bank. Um, and it, it, it has six different uh, toolkits that, a, a, deal with different aspects of the, um, the planning process, the feasibility assessment, developing the business plan, uh, capitalizing and preparing for operations, and then implementation. The, the first toolkit in that series talks about the food bank concept and the role of the global food banking network. And attached it to that toolkit as an appendix is a document that, um, that we refer to as uh, engagement criteria. And in that document is a definition of the standards that are required for a food bank uh, to follow in order to achieve uh, GFN certification. Most of you are in this session because you are uh, beginning the process of putting your food bank together or just um, are very, very recently um, uh, established as a food bank and beginning to, um, to actually operate. Um, so for, for you, you, you typically are looking at a two to three year process of evolving your organization's operations and administration uh, in order to reach the point of compliance with the standards of GFN membership. And GFN will work with you um, to move through that process of uh, becoming compliant with all of those standards. There is no fee uh, for GFN engagement and support. Um, we do not charge you uh, to become, to, to receive technical assistance and guidance uh, from us, nor do we charge you um, uh, a membership fee. Once you become a certified member of GFN, there is no membership fee uh, for participation uh, in the network. Um, so uh, when, when we are finished with the uh, session today, uh, later in the day, our time, um, you will receive a, an, 
email from us that will include uh, several different links. One link will be uh, to the recording of this session. And another link will be to access the toolkits um, that I just uh, enumerated for you. And, um, and as part of the toolkits, uh, that listing of uh, GFN certification requirements. Um, all right, we have another question here. What kind of direct resources can GFN provide to help establish food banks in the community? Um, so unfortunately, uh, COVID has, um, has shut down our, our ability uh, to travel and we, we're hoping that as uh, immunization works its way around the world, um, that, uh, that we'll see some light at the end of the tunnel uh, in terms of that travel restriction. Um, but the, in, the, in the meantime, uh, GFN, depending on, um, on where you're located in the world, um, there, there may be food banks relatively um, uh, regional, regionally nearby that um, GFN can uh, engage you in communication with for some technical assistance and, and some mentoring uh, from a from a, a, a sister food bank, um, and certainly GFN staff, um, our field team will be focused uh, on providing you guidance and and um, technical assistance along the way, depending on uh, the the level of development that you're at. If you're still in the planning mode um, and and the even pre planning, just uh, uh, just thinking through the concept at this point and trying to, to prepare to plan, um, we, we will uh, work with you through uh, the guidance offered in the uh, toolkit series that we have, um, uh, Zoom calls and telephone calls and email and sharing uh, sample uh, materials and forms and, um, and documents that will help you to, to think through um, putting your plan together and reaching the point of getting operated, uh, getting operational. Um, and once you are operational, helping you to assess the operations, recognize that it never goes the way you plan it to go. Something always goes wrong. Um, and, and we will help you to figure out how to deal with whatever obstacle or, or failure against plan um, that occurs um, and help you think through how to manage that um, and not overreact and, and implement a fix for this function that ends up having an unintended consequence on that function. We'll, we'll, we'll walk you through that process and, and, and help you along the way. And then once we are able to travel again, um, it would be our hope that we come in country and begin to uh, deliver direct face-to-face uh, in-person technical assistance, moving you toward compliance with the, the criteria for certification so that we can make you a full certified member of the network. A question here from the uh, Yemen Food Bank. Uh, Yemen has good agricultural land, but many products such as carrots, tomatoes, and bananas are lost and wasted. How can food banks prevent that product from being wasted? So uh, a lot of uh, food, food banks uh, have moved in the direction of building relationships directly with farmers and packing houses uh, in order to try and minimize waste at the, at the um, post-harvest level. Um, and be able to acquire product that for one reason or another is not working its way through the typical market process um, to the, to the, uh, through distribution to retail. Um, the second, or, <laughs> second harvest, um, GFN uh, itself is investigating at this point the creation of a smallholder farmer uh, pilot project to uh, try and accelerate this kind of engagement between food banks and smallholder farmers uh, in particular. Um, and we expect to um, be moving forward on that pilot project um, 
uh, starting later in, in this year. But even aside from that, um, food banks already uh, in, in a number of different countries have built very, very successful um, uh, protocols and processes for engaging in partnership with farmers um, and packing houses and are recovering significant quantities of uh, fresh produce. And we can draw um, from the successes of those food banks to provide technical assistance uh, to help make that um, possible uh, there in Yemen and in other places. We have a, a comment um, from uh, one person, the data on nutritional status of the population is important. I would like to encourage people to explore this, not only hunger, but access to nutritious food. Um, we, we fully agree with that. Uh, the, the, it's, it's as important to put a focus on nutritional um, value of, of donated product as it is um, on, on the, the issue of donated product in general. Um, in, in many, many, many countries, um, the, the issue is not just about getting calories into people, but um, because of uh, severity of malnutrition uh, and the implications of malnutrition, uh, trying to make sure that we are enhancing the nutritional mix and, and, and availability of product that we uh, can um, get uh, to the clients that are served by the agencies receiving product from the food bank. Um, and, uh, and that should be an important part of your planning process as you're designing your program base. Uh, we have a question here that, um, that I'd like to ask um, uh, uh, Doug or Lisa actually to talk about because I think they're a little bit more um, familiar with the direct relationship than, than I am. Uh, the question is, do, do we have any experience of a third party logistics company partnering with the food bank? Um, and, uh, and we do have a global partner, uh, Brambles, um, so that you might know them as CHEP, um, uh, that we built a, a global partnership with um, some years ago. Uh, Lisa or Doug, uh, can I call on one of you to talk about that partnership? Go ahead, Doug. Thank you. Um, yes, we have a global partnership with CHEP um, that helps advise and works directly with some food banks. In addition, there are logistics firms in individual countries that may also work directly with the food bank. So what GFN would do in an instance like, like is being asked about is that we would identify with you if, we, if, if available, um, either a global partner like a CHEP or a local um, in-country partner that could help provide that service. In general, um, this is usually a transition stage uh, because food banks um, will typically start to operate their own logistics at some point in their in their development. But at an early stage of a food bank, it is oftentimes a very useful means in which to get product from from point A to point B or to or to you know, secure the resources, the food resources. Um, but we would address that on a, on a uh, individual basis. There are some, again, there are some examples um, out there. We'd have to, we'd get that to you, but, um, uh, but we want to facilitate a way that makes the most sense for, for your evolution and growth. Great, thank you, Doug. Um, and, and I can, uh, I can uh, speak uh, that um, a company like uh, Brambles has been helpful on two different levels, actually. Uh, one way that they uh, can be helpful is that they can come in and, um, and do a, a review of your, op your warehouse operations um, and give very strong counsel uh, about how to improve traffic flow through the building or how to improve use of equipment or racking. Um, and, and the second way that they can be helpful because, uh, because of the nature of their, their business where they provide pallets and other, other um, equipment for use in um, food uh, warehouses uh, is that they've been able to create partnerships uh, with local food banks 
um, to make some of those uh, resources available at uh, no cost or or at significantly discounted cost. So um, so uh, spe as specific need arises there, as Doug said, um, uh, alert that to us and uh, and we can pursue a couple of different directions uh, to provide support. There's a question about whether there's a specific date to start with mentoring sessions um, and how it will work. Um, no, there's not a specific date. Uh, if, if after uh, having participated in this session this, today, um, you would like to um, have GFN engage with you to help you through the planning process and, and move forward, uh, then we would ask that you send us an email um, the email address will also be in the e in the email that we send you later with the links to the um, recording and to the the toolkits. I'll give you that email address now. It is new food bank team at foodbanking.org. Again, that'll be in the email you receive later. If you send us an email um, at that address, we will respond by sending back to you a questionnaire uh, to gather um, more information about you, about the, the status of where you are in planning and or operations. And if you are operational, we'll ask you a number of questions about the nature of your operations and the scale of your operations. Um, and once you return that back to us, um, it will trigger a follow-up um, and we'll, we'll likely schedule a Zoom meeting with you uh, to uh, uh, get additional information, uh, to clarify any information uh, that comes to us in the questionnaire, um, and then ultimately to begin to build a work plan with you uh, to define how to move forward um, and what the, um, the, the uh, specific factors and, and uh, terms of our continuing uh, to, to support you will look like. A question uh, from Guinea-Bissau. Um, do we have a GFN office near Guinea-Bissau? Um, and and uh, from, the, from the way the question is worded, it, it appears that you specifically want to know whether we actually have an office uh, there. We do not have an office in, in, uh, on the African continent. Um, and uh, but we do have uh, dedicated services, obviously, uh, to support food bank development and um, existing food banks on the African continent. Um, and so we can follow through with you, uh, as I just uh, suggested um, in the in response to the previous question. A question about the toolkits and whether they have standard models of the processes or detailed guides to develop each stage. Um, the, the toolkits that focus on feasibility assessment and on business plan development and on capitalization plan development um, do have recommended um, guidance on how to um, how to create the various uh, chapters, if you will, um, that are required to make a comprehensive plan. Um, I, I, I think that's what, uh, what, what you're asking there. Um, we, uh, we also have some sample business plans, for example, um, and we can make those available to you so you get a feel for what the end product ought to look like um, in, uh, in, as you are in the process of building your own um, end product. I see that my colleague David has uh, um, typed in uh, in the chat uh, section or the chat window for all attendees, the email address um, that you would contact uh, in order to begin the process of engagement with GFN new food bank team at foodbanking.org. The next question we have uh, in Mozambique, there are many 
denitrification problems and many seasonal foods, would it be in our competence to install an agricultural processing plant? Hmm. Um, that's a good question. There are some food banks that have gone the route of establishing um, uh, uh, programs to extend shelf life of, uh, of fresh fruits and vegetables by processing them in one way or another. Uh, in, in one case, the food bank um, has access to incredible volumes of tomatoes and they process that to a tomato sauce. Um, in, uh, in another situation, um, there is a food bank that um, uh, does similar canning, um, not, not processing into a, a different end product, but just canning um, of uh, fruits in order to extend shelf life. I, I think that that is a viable direction for a food bank to go. I would not suggest that that it be a direction that a newly developing food bank would go simply because of the complexity and the cost related to it. Um, if, if you are serious about establishing the food bank, um, I, I would recommend that you do that first and you, and you get the food bank launched, get its operations launched, kind of prove the concept, if you will, so that you can begin to build a sustainable and scalable uh, operation. And once that is in place, then move in the direction of ancillary programming like uh, the creation of agricultural processing or, or any other um, um, non-core function uh, uh, from a food bank perspective. Um, I, 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 I don't mean to uh, discourage going in that direction. I'm, I, would, I only suggest it because it, if, if you put too much um, on the plate for getting the food bank operation up and running, um, you make it all the more difficult to generate and stabilize the resource base that will sustain the operation going forward. And, and, and it's a little bit of mission creep, um, if I can say it that way. So I would, I would focus on getting the food bank launched and stabilized first, and then move in the direction of uh, extra programming. Okay, um, it looks like that uh, is addressing all of the questions that we had received. So um, uh, I, would, I, I would say that uh, it looks like we're at the, um, the end of our session uh, for the day. I would like to thank all of the presenters um, for um, being part of the presentation and most of- Hey, Chris. Yes. Chris, sorry, this is Lisa. Could you talk for a minute about um, when food banks are eligible to receive financing from GFN and what that process looks like? Oh, sure. Thank you. Sure. So GFN does have um, uh, funding available for uh, a number of different kinds of grants um, that we that we make out uh, to food banks in our in our network. Um, there are uh, a number of factors that need to be met in order for us to be able to release uh, funds for um, for those various purposes. Um, it, First, just by, by uh, United States law, because GFN is a United States um, based NGO, uh, we're subject to laws, the laws of our country uh, regarding the movement of funds um, uh, out of the United States uh, to foreign entities. Um, and, uh, and, and so we're required to do a uh, fairly extensive process of due diligence to establish the validity and the um, and the um, credibility of the organizations that we provide the funding to. Um, there is uh, expenditure 
responsibility to ensure that the funds are used for the purpose that they're sent for, uh, extensive reporting requirements um, to demonstrate that and to provide evidence um, that the funds were used for their intended purpose, all, all of that kind of legal stuff that we have to that we have to deal with. But even, even before getting to that point, um, GFN has to have um, has to have established that uh, the organization that we uh, uh, that is requesting funding or that we are interested in providing funding to, um, in fact, uh, is a, uh, a, a food bank um, uh, headed, uh, cre created for and delivering um, food banking services in its uh, community and has established um, uh, the appropriate programmatic and administrative um, and governance-based um, uh, credibility to ensure that the funds uh, can be used for the promotion of food banking and the food bank's programming um, and uh, for the purposes of building capacity um, and extending capability. Um, we, we have, during the past year, um, provided a significant amount of uh, money to food banks in dozens of countries um, to sustain the, uh, the uh, unprecedented increase in demand caused by the COVID pandemic. Um, and uh, aside from that kind of funding, we also have funding that is focused on capacity building. So acquiring vehicles or, or enhancing uh, warehouse uh, facilities or hiring staff for, um, uh, uh, for uh, program execution. Um, and funding uh, related costs to program delivery, that sort of thing. Um, a, a new organization that we are working with uh, to go through um, planning and, and ultimately implementation of the operation would not likely be um, a recipient of grant funds um, initially. Um, it would uh, the, the availability of those funds would come after the uh, operations are launched and demonstrated um, uh, uh, effectiveness and, and, um, and credibility. Am I missing anything, Lisa, that, that I should hit there? Not at all. Thank you, Chris. Okay. Okay. So, um, Again, uh, thank you all to, for taking the time um, to participate in the session today. Uh, watch for the email that will be coming to you soon uh, with the links to the various resources um, and uh, be in touch with us uh, if you would like to talk about uh, GFN en engagement and moving forward. Um, I do want to point out as, uh, as we have on the screen here, that participating in the session and, and the use of our toolkits or other training resources um, does not constitute uh, a, a, a promise of engagement um, from GFN and, and, um, and does not um, provide a blanket um, permission for um, repurpose or, or, um, or uh, uh, editing of our materials and, and that sort of thing. Um, just always have to bring up the, uh, the, the legal disclaimers in, in, uh, in everything that we do, right? Um, so uh, the, again, this, this kind of information is incorporated in the, uh, in the toolkits that you'll uh, receive from us. So I want to acknowledge and thank our generous sponsors for uh, the GFN Food Bank Leadership Institute. These include um, our partners, uh, General Mills, HEB, Brambles, Cargill, the DLA Piper Foundation, Fundacion Lala, and Ingredian. The uh, recording link and the, um, the uh, toolkit link and the email address uh, will be in the email coming out later today, uh, our time. Um, and we look forward to uh, continued engagement with you um, after we hear back uh, from you by email. Thank you very much.